Welcome to morning worship. 1 Timothy 5, 17. Read just this one verse this morning. Keith already read one from the Psalms about touch not mine anointed. And we're, we're dealing, we're, we're preaching on preachers this morning, if you would. 1 Timothy 5, 17 says, Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, or double respect, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine or teaching. Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you for the inspired text this morning. Bless it to our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 My sermon, once again, is entitled, All Preachers Great and Small. I know you recognize I'm doing a play on words there, but all preachers great and small. And my entire Christian life, I've been drawn to preaching. Even before I was called to preach, I just, I loved preaching. I, I, after I got saved, I just uh, stayed on the radio or something trying to listen to that AM, uh, AM preaching. And, and there's all kinds of various styles uh, of preaching. And I, I hope that you are never so narrow to think that there's only one of those styles that's right and all the rest of them are wrong. Because uh, I, I don't believe that. In fact, if you look through the Bible, all the preachers wasn't alike. It's all different, it seems like. We're different human beings. We have uh, different personalities. Some are, some are, well, let's just look at some of the Bible. There's old, old Moses. God called Moses. You know, and Moses didn't want to do it. He said, I can't speak well. Get somebody else. Send my brother Aaron to do it. And uh, We ended up getting five books of our Bible and at least one psalm from Moses. And then there's a weeping Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, you know. And if you read Jeremiah, and it don't look like Jeremiah ever won anybody. But boy, he pronounced the judgment, and everywhere he went, he was crying. He had a burden from the Lord, and he had all kinds of critics. And, and I know that there had to be a lot of people saying about old Jeremiah, well, he can't even preach for crying. Who wants to listen to him? He's just an old sad sack. A weeping Jeremiah. And then there was the dramatic actor, Ezekiel. Ezekiel will make you laugh, but it was very serious. I mean, he, he did dramatic acting to show people what God was about to do. One time he, he dug a, down through the bottom of his house and come out in the street. <laughs> Another time he shaved his beard and his head off and he cut the hair in three different pieces and he had a lesson from that. And I think it's another time that he, he walked around actually naked with that Ezekiel. <laughs> Laid on his side for days, and his, they'd say, what are you doing? That, that prophet's crazy. And he said, this is what God's going to do to you, you know. And then even there's old reluctant Jonah. He didn't want to do what God told him to do, but God had anointed him to do something. God had called him to do something. He tried to run the other way, but God saw that it got done anyway. Even though John, Jonah's heart wasn't right, he went through the city, and he proclaimed the message that God told him to proclaim. And all of Nineveh got right with God. And then we come down to the New Testament. There's old Paul. You know, they say dynamite sometimes comes in small packages. Now, I don't know if this is true or not. It's, it's church history slash legend. But you ever heard about Paul? They, they, they think Paul, according to legend, was a, was a little short, bald, fat man. And you probably just don't picture him that way when you're reading his messages in the Bible. But uh, it's not about the messenger. It's about the message, ain't it? And I've, my entire Christian life, and I still do once in a while, I go through the Bible, and you can read, you know, we've got recorded sermons in the New Testament and, and Old too, but through the New Testament you can read some of the sermons that Peter preached in Acts or some of the sermons that Paul preached or, or the words of Jesus, Sermon on the Mount. And I, and I listen to other preachers, and I try to think, what kind of preaching style did they do? What kind of preaching style did Jesus, and you can try the different ones, you know, and you kind of say, I don't believe Jesus sounded like that one, you know, but uh, not that one's right and others wrong, they're all different things. And then the preachers in our day, as I already alluded to, when I first got saved, AM radio, 30 years ago, was full of preaching. You know, seven days a week, if you turned on the local AM stations, I, I remember being up in the mountains building my little, uh, it's a tool room now, but it used to be my hunting cabin, I called it. And I'd be out there, and I'd have them preachers going. I was up there by myself, and I was listening to them preachers, and I, I was nailing boards up and, and everything. And, uh, and and you still find some on AM radio. It's like when I was coming in this morning, I was uh, 
listening to, I, I found five different ones at the same time. AM 800, AM 1220, everything from Protestant Hour to uh, Les Feldick to some of the local guys. And on one station I counted it twice because every once in a while the other preacher would come in and bleed over this one. There's two different ones on the same station there. So there's still a lot of different things there, including when I, I, I wish it would come on at 8.30 so I could listen to all of them, but uh, Dad's first cousin, Ted Watson, is still on the air, and he died four or five years ago. <laughs> But he still, his son plays his sermons on there at 12.20 a.m. at 9 a.m. every Sunday morning. And he's still preaching. He's been in heaven for a long time, but, but he's still preaching through the miracle of uh, recordings and radio, I guess. I had the privilege of sitting under Dr. Fred Craddock for two years at, at Divinity School, probably the most renowned preaching instructor in America still today. That's not to say that I'm anything but he was an interesting and magnificent instructor. And if you just met him, kind of like Paul I was talking about, you, you wouldn't see anything that would give, give away. And, and, and he wasn't all that charismatic, and he wasn't loud or anything, but, but when he would teach and preach, he had a way of just like, he just stepped into the Bible and like he just took you by the hand and walked around from story to story and interwove them with your life and the things that are going on, the application of the Word of God. And he was just an amazing man. I don't think he's even living anymore. I still hear people reference him once in a while. And there's so many different styles of preaching. Wesley may have been there many years ago up at Piney Grove when uh, we had a, a Miss Margie Carlock was a, a black lady, was our Sunday school teacher, and uh, she wanted to do something as like as when they first started that Black History Month back then. And we got through her, invited uh, Reverend Looney, a black preacher who was kind of famous from up in Athens at the time. And uh, I remember he preached with that black sing-song style of, of preaching. You know? It's just interesting to hear all the different preaching styles. And then uh, as we go back, uh, well, if you go up in the mountains where, where I live, it, you'll, you'll hear this one a lot of times. Uh, people call them uh, different things, mountain hackers or whatever. But... Uh, if you ain't doing it up there, they probably don't think that you're preaching. But it goes something like, you know, I'm here to tell you now, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. <laughs> and I ain't making fun of that. You know, that's, that's just what people have been raised on. And everything. there's all these different kinds of, of preachers in, in the world. And then the, the most famous sermon that's ever been preached in America, undoubtedly, was Jonathan Edwards when the Reformation, when, not the Reformation, but the Great Awakening occurred. And still today, they assign it to you to read in literature classes in college. Thank God for that. <laughs> and Jonathan Edwards had that famous sermon called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And it was very scary. It's about how God holds you over the pit of hell that could drop you at any time just like we could hold a spider over a flame of a candle. And as I read, not just the sermon, but you read about Jonathan Edwards and what was going on in the church at that time, you find out that, that Jonathan Edwards probably didn't preach that the way most people think he did. They said that he, he could hardly see. It was dark in the church, and he had a candle up there on the pulpit, and it was a full manuscript sermon that he had written out and he was having trouble seeing it and reading it. But the Holy Ghost of God fell. And people got under conviction. And people got right with God. And it was the beginning of the great awakening in America. Like a revival like we've never never had before. And during my, my, my time at Duke, each morning before class, you had to go to chapel. And one of the seniors from that year got to preach I got to do that once everybody got one one turn you know but uh, after five years I heard a lot of different preachers some of them good and some of them I wouldn't want to listen to and and, and some of them uh, you know they're just all different kinds there and then we think some of the most famous preachers in America in the 20th century and you go from Billy Sunday to Billy Graham and Billy Sunday and Billy Graham had nothing alike in their preaching styles even though they were both Baptists 
Billy Sunday was more like that hacking kind of thing that I did, and he was animated, and he jumped all over the stage and pulled it everywhere and everything, and you've seen Billy Graham, you know, Billy Graham is more of a dignified type of guy who speaks and gives these little, uh, being from North Carolina mountains, I guess, gives these little uh, illustrations that country people and understand and city people alike about farms and mountains and things like that, but the Probably the two greatest preachers in the 20th century. Charles Haddon Spurgeon in the, in the 19th century. You know, he died in 1892, I think it was. I've got probably 20 books of his with two different sets. From, and reading him, he was like a, a genius. You know, he's like he just evidently had an incredibly high IQ. And... Uh, I, I don't think his sermons were written out before he preached them, but he had a stenographer that typed them down. Is the reason we have all that stuff today. And then you go back 100 years before him, I got all the works of John Wesley, who died in 1792. I think Wesley is 1792, and Spurgeon was 1892, their deaths. Mm -hmm. And I got the works of Wesley in there, and you, and you read Wesley, and uh, I'll be honest with you, I can say this since I'm not a Methodist anymore, Wesley's kind of boring compared to Spurgeon. <laughs> But both of them won a lot of people to Christ. You know, they were just, they were the Billy Grahams of their centuries. And they, they knew the Lord. And it's kind of like, here's where the punchline's going. All preachers, great and small. It's just like the all preachers, great and small. God made them all. Amen. <laughs> all preachers, great and small, and God made them all. The short and fat, the skinny and tall. All colors, shapes, and sizes, and various degrees of intellect. If they're preachers if at all, if they're true preachers, then God made them and God called them through the various styles and personalities that they have. And if they're true preachers, then even though they have different styles of preaching and different levels of intellect and different levels of charisma, whatever, they've got the same basic message. And none of them are infallible. The book is infallible, but the preachers aren't. I certainly ain't. But what preachers are is people who have dedicated their lives to trying to understand this book and trying to convey the words of God, the word of God, to the people of God. And We're not infallible, but we've got a God who is, and his word is. They have the same basic message. All styles, if they're true preachers of all, begins with that you're a sinner in need of grace due to a Savior. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, but God loves us in spite of our sins. Amen. So much that he sent his only begotten son to die on Calvary's cross that we could be reconciled to God through the death of his son and be considered Righteous, as if we had never sinned. Justified because Jesus took our sins upon himself. And he's our helper. He, did, he didn't just die on the cross and stay dead. He died on the cross for our sins and he came out of a tomb three days later. Therefore, he's our ever-present companion, our friend, and our helper. Not just somebody we read about like Napoleon or George Washington back there somewhere, but he's alive today. He walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me that I'm his own. That's the message that every true preacher can preach and that we'll spend eternity with him in heaven and that he's worthy to be worshipped. May we pray. Lord, we do thank you today for all preachers, great and small. We live for a time where the world certainly doesn't respect preachers very much anymore. We know that you do and that God does, and may we also hold them in high esteem as they've sacrificed much for that calling in their life. Thank you for old-fashioned and faithful preachers, Lord, who still proclaim God's word as the inspired word of God from this blessed old black back book we call the Holy Bible. Help us, Lord, to hold this Bible in high esteem and help us, Lord, to be witnesses. We, we grieve sometimes about the church not having the power that it once had, and I've still been praying about that and seeking it quite a bit, Lord, and I, I do realize that a lot of things have been brought to my attention 
by the Holy Ghost and maybe by others that I've been talking to that, that one of the problems, Lord, is that the witness of the church is so weak and the world looks at us and, and sees uh, just a bunch of people that go to church and proclaim Christ and they don't live like it. May we live like it because we know that the way we live when we profess Christ has to do with eternity for people that are watching us out there. Lord, we give this Christian invitation today to anybody here that may not know Jesus and the free pardon of sin, that today's the day and now's the accepted time and they can go out this church house knowing that they've got a friend in Jesus who died for their sins and rose again and will be with them every step of the way. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.